Hello everyone and welcome to the Teacher Enrichment Program's Bite of Science. TIPS Bite of Science webinars brings together scientists and engineers from industry, academia, and government of secondary STEM teachers to expose teachers to new and exciting science tips. Um, science technologies and explore a variety of topics that illustrate the interdisciplinary nature of STEM and the real world applications of STEM skills. Following this session, this video, presentation slides, and supporting materials will be um, loaded onto the TEP lab bench for teachers to access and use in their class classroom. And the link to these resources will be placed in our chat. The Center for Excellence in Education was founded in 1983 by Joanne De Janeiro, who is our current president, and Admiral Rickover, father of the nuclear Navy and civilian uses of nuclear power with a mission to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in STEM. Our programs include um, programs for teachers and students, which includes our Research Science Institute, our USABO or USA Biolympiad, our Teacher Enrichment Program, and our STEM license program. Again, our programs will be listed in the chat along with their links to um, learn more about this video. Um, it, again, it will be edited and shared on CEE's YouTube channel and social media platforms. Uh, today, we're excited to have four speakers. We have Dr. Christian Dorjax. Um, he's a biology professor with Virginia State University. We have Mark Kantrowitz, uh, who's the director of the Research Science Institute and president of Cerebly Incorporated. And we have Rob Beach, who is a senior staff regional products um, support engineer at Illumina, as well as Steve Dickinson, um, associate director, um, product support engineer with Illumina. We will have a Q&A session at the end of these presentations, so please use the um, Q&A function to ask any questions that you may have. And with that, we'll take it away with Dr. Jordan. All right, can all of you see um, the presentation in three parts? Yes, sir. Good, um, hi. I gave a talk here a number of years ago and um, I talked on lizards and on frogs and um, I don't want to disappoint you people by any of you who were there before and that maybe my uh, focus is too narrow. I'm happy to tell you that I, I am also interested in turtles. So today I'm going to talk about turtles. And actually um, for the, the time, what I think I'm going to do is I'll have to go through fairly rapidly. You'll have the slides and the pictures. First of all, I just want to talk about Sort of a serendipitous project that happened um, and I'll tell you about that, turtles on the tracks. Then I'm going to talk about sex and climate change and then I just want to uh, briefly talk about potentially how to involve students no matter what area of STEM you're in. So first of all, a number of years ago I was um, working with Joe Mitchell, a herpetologist here in Virginia, and he wanted to do a survey uh, basically of the um, national battlefields in Virginia. And one of the things we are interested in is this lizard here, the six-lined race runner, whether in fact they use this one of the a lizard that um, has a very high body temperature, typically it doesn't occur in Virginia, and it uses railroad tracks as a way to extend its range from warmer areas into cooler areas because of the creosote on the, the ties between the tracks and the gravel reflects a very hot environment. So these lizards are um, extending their range using railroad tracks. So this was a, a track that's adjacent to the battlefield. So we went out to look and see if we could find them. And in fact, we didn't find um, any of the six-lined race runners. What we found was this dead turtle, it was a box turtle. So then I thought, well, I haven't thought about this before, but, you know, one, you know, our railroad tracks uh, basically impeding the movement of, you know, different turtles are, uh, we found a dead one between the tracks, are they catching them? Um, and then if so, we um, wanted to see extrapolate from the data that we had and see, well, what would be the impact on larger areas of track? So here's a pristine site where we, uh, Petersburg National Battlefield 
is, I don't know if you can see it, but it's more or less in the middle of the screen here. And it, as you can see, is surrounded by commercial and suburbia. Um, and, but I hear this again, the site. If you can see colors up on the upper portion of the screen, there's a red line. And that is a northern section of railroad tracks. And down below is our southern section of railroad tracks. And we went out twice a week for four months from May through basically August and two separate years. And we walked along the tracks to see what we could find. This is our northern track. And here's the southern track. And lo and behold, what we started finding were different turtles. We collected data on the turtles we found as to size of a turtle, species, sex, and uh, this Nikisha here is checking out turtles like trees have growth rings and you can see them on the shelves and you can basically count how old um, a turtle is. So I'm going to go very quickly here because we did find some turtles and this is one species we found, box turtles. And this was sections of the track we found them in. But here's another per, uh, species, a spotted turtle, which is um, a fairly rare turtle now. Um, and it's a little hard to see, but here's a spotted turtle. It's a red-bellied cooter. If I have time, I'll get back and uh, tell you, uh, you know, one of the things about them being this one is dead, obviously. And in fact, it was a female and I don't have a picture, but I'll just tell you, she had extruded a bunch of eggs. This is a snapping turtle, and I just want to point out, I was um, uh, corrected or made aware of at a, another conference, actually a herpetology conference, specifically on turtles. This is not the way to hold the snapping turtle. This is what I had been taught by other herpetologists, but apparently uh, holding them by the tail, which is a safe way for humans to hold them so you don't get scratched or bitten, can um, uh, just dislocate their vertebrae. So we don't do that anymore. So don't hold snapping turtles this way. Take your chance. Uh, here's another species of turtle, a mud turtle, another Eastern River cooter, red-eared slider, and another red-eared slider. So uh, this is just showing that the two sections of the railroad tracks, the little dots are where we found various turtles and different species. So we found 37 individuals. And we, what's pretty amazing is that not seven of the nine potential species that could be found in this location of Virginia, we found um, on the tracks. And here they are again. Um, you come back and look at this. But more importantly, perhaps, is unfortunately, as you can see, this is actually a dead turtle a box turtle. And what I'd like you to get from this slide is simply there's, is that the big red bars are the turtles that were found dead. Um, and this is by species. But in general, you can see that either they're being, they're dead or 50-50 and it's very small sample size. But essentially the tracks are really impacting um, uh, turtles in obviously a negative way. This also is showing um, that, again, the main message here is the big, the tallest bars here typically are females. And so female turtles seem to be disproportionately uh, impacted by the tracks. And what we did then is we extrapolated from, okay, so we were looking at 1.6 kilometers of each section of track here, and we took um, GIS data. We used um, different layers to try and predict what would be a good habitat for turtles. And then we, play, we used that to exclude habitat that wouldn't be good and try to figure out if we followed railroad tracks about how much of um, and how much space is available for turtles around tracks. And so we looked at this initially first within um, our study site. And that is where the red lines are. And uh, this is the general area 
of the uh, study site. We made buffers. And then what we did is we started to enlarge this and start looking at following railroad tracks. And so we extrapolated to the state of Virginia, where we are. And so there's about 7,450 uh, 7, kilometers of, of uh, track. And basically using this, we predicted about 64% of the habitat that they're going through could potentially have turtles. And this figure is extremely rough and um, uh, because there are a lot of other variables, but basically that's about, you know, 73,000 turtles a year. And if you break it down per, um, in Virginia, um, and it comes out to about 25 turtles a mile. If we were to go further, and we haven't done this, but would like to, is to look at habitat throughout the United States to try to figure out the potential impact, especially on species that are um, endangered. And I should just point out, there's about 400, over 400 species and subspecies of turtles, and they are among the most impacted and, and of vertebrates for essentially the effects of climate change and for habitat use and for extinction of all vertebrate groups. So ultimately we'd like to um, enlarge the study, collaborate with other people and do North America and potentially the world. So now let's have intermission, okay? And let's do, now we're back, about part two, sex and climate change. As you're aware, probably things are getting warmer. And one of the repercussions, again, for turtles, unlike people, their sex in most turtles is actually determined during a period, it's usually during the latter third period of incubation when the eggs are laid and is dependent on temperature. So terrestrial turtles that are laying their eggs, all turtles actually lay their eggs on land. Um, and so, that temperature is critical. And in general, females are produced at warmer temperatures, males are produced at cooler temperatures, and then in between, there's you know, approximately 50-50 of, and it depends on what the species is for what those temperatures are. The problem is, is it's getting warmer, the potential for producing a biased sex ratio of either more females or males on, um, can throw off ultimately the population in terms of its ability to reproduce and um, potentially face extinction. So, as I said before, there are a bunch of species of turtles. More than 50% are predicted right now because of not just this climate change, habitat use, people eat turtles, the pet trade, turtles are having a rough time. So, serendipitously, this is another one. Uh, at the university, we have an a aquaculture farm, Randolph Farm, that has about 57 of these ponds. And if you look at the um, walkway, to the left is a floating fish rearing trap, and to the right now is one of our, our turtle traps. And we started this project because someone at the farm wanted me to identify turtles that were coming in and eating their fish. And initially, all the traps didn't have uh, this one now has a lid on it to protect the uh, fish. So we, we started coming out there and trapping turtles after to, uh, for this other project. And here's some my students pulling up a trap. Here we are, my graduate student currently, Renee McGilvery, and some other, other students for the data. And what we were interested in is um, the sex of the turtles. So. The, on the left here, your left, is a male. A male, this is a red-eared slider, have very long claws that they use in uh, mating dance to attract females in front of them, vibrate them in front of the female. And to the right is a male. And so we're getting data on um, the, the different turtles is from a trap and also their different species. But I'm just going to show you one. Sometimes there's like to use my biology, um, general biology, zoology classes have come out. And sometimes there are enough turtles for everybody to hold one. And we're marking them and then we uh, release them back in after we've sexed them and taken different uh, measurements. 
What I want you to see is our hypothesis is climate is, uh, temperatures are increasing. So we would expect to see a skewed sex ratio towards more females being um, hatched. Yet what we're finding is that that, that it, it is not significant, the difference. Some years the females are, uh, the males are this first column, the darker column in blue, females in orange. So some year, a few more females, lots more males here and, and so on. And then the very last column, there are a few more females, but the difference is not significant. And um, there's a number of reasons we're exploring for that. Uh, because of time, you can ask me after. Um, I, I'll uh, just say that um, we were somewhat surprised, but um, uh, I'll, I can discuss that later. So um, another intermission for you. And let's go to the last part of the talk. So I was thinking what I'm going to talk about, I'm talking somewhat using an example of Virginia, but this could be done anywhere. But first, I want to say two things. Um, I do teach at a historically uh, black college and university. So um, particularly for all STEM students, most, a lot of people are thinking medicine and certainly most of my students are thinking of getting into the medical sciences. And uh, I just wanna say that um, nothing against medicine is wonderful and we need it, but the opportunities in other areas and especially, uh, honestly also for for minority students is phenomenal. And there's, there's a, an incredible amount of support. And I just will say as an aside, because I just find this amazing and astounding, one of my students who's gone on and got his master's at University of Michigan, got a full ride there. Now he's at uh, Columbia University. They, he is doing his doctorate now. They are giving him, I think it's 92,000 a year for support as a doctoral student. Why? Because he's in evolution. He's very well qualified, but he's in evolution and ecology, which is an area that many students and minority students just are unaware of or don't go into. So I, I really um, feel there's incredible opportunities there for uh, the future. This is what I was thinking for you as, uh, as teachers. There's a, um, a website called iNaturalist and um, I, because I'm here in Virginia, I'm going to talk just very briefly, um, Virginia Herpetological Society, iNaturalist, if you go on, has a teacher's guide. And essentially what you can do is report with photographs, have your students get involved in reporting any kind of animal. It can be an insect, a plant, can, or it can be plants, um, you, know, you know, reptiles and so on with photographs. And what I was uh, thinking is, or because of time here, I won't really be able to tell you too much about it, but the turtles I was showing you, this is a native turtle that should occur here. Yet this turtle here, red, uh, red-eared sliders have been introduced. They're both the same species, different subspecies. So they hybridize. And what I believe is going to happen is that the native species, the yellow-bellied slider here, is ultimately going to disappear and uh, we'll just get hybrids. And uh, that will basically be the extinction for a, a species, it's a subspecies, but been around for thousands of years. So this is something that using iNaturalist anywhere, you could report or say in Virginia, but you could extrapolate this to any area where you have any area in, in the country, there are introduced species that are having impact on native species. And I thought that one of the things people here in Virginia could do would be looking, having their students, whether they're in math, whether they're in biology, whatever the STEM technology, you can use iNaturalist to report things and as a database, and we could see, I'm very interested in seeing the extension of red-eared sliders and how they're moving into yellow-bellied slider habitat. Well, uh, I just want to thank you all very much. And I just would like to, to just acknowledge these people. And I will see all of you later. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. My name is Mark Kantrowitz. 
Uh, and uh, let's start with my path. I'm an alumnus from the 1984, the first year of the Research Science Institute. And I returned this year as director of RSI, coming full circle. Uh, we had 92 students. We're going to increase it to 100 students in 2023, this coming year. And the uh, applications are available right now uh, on the CEE.org website uh, through December 2nd is the deadline. So my training was as a research scientist. I got two bachelor of science degrees in mathematics and philosophy from MIT. Then I got a master's degree in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and uh, rather than finishing my PhD, I went directly into research. Um, I worked uh, at a research lab called Just Research, uh, and I had previously worked for the Planning Research Corporation, MIT AI Lab, and Bistream Inc. I have eight patents. Now, along the way, I was one of those kids who won a gazillion dollars for college, both undergraduate and graduate. I graduated from MIT with more money than when I started. And I published a book in 1993 about scholarships and fellowships for math and science students because there were known at the time. And I started getting questions by email. And then rather than answer the same questions again and again, I posted them answers to these questions on a website because the web had just started. Uh, in fact, I had started one of the first 100 commercial websites. I, it acted like a nonprofit, but it was um, incorporated as a for-profit entity. Uh, and then I started uh, answering questions before they were asked, and then the website took on a life of its own uh, and just kept on doubling every month in terms of traffic. Um, by late 1999, I decided to quit my job at the end of the year, as so I'd no longer be a research scientist, to focus on the websites full time uh, because I figured I'd do more good for society, helping people figure out how to get into and pay for college than by building a better web search engine. Most of my former colleagues ended up at Google. Uh, and I still do research, but my research is about college access, college affordability, and college success. It's research that involves real people, which I think is more challenging than research about uh, in theoretical subjects like mathematics uh, and physics, um, because the real world is a lot messier. Uh, I wrote uh, several best-selling books about planning and paying for college. The most recent one is Who Graduates from College, Who Doesn't? Uh, and right before the pandemic, I wrote a book about how to appeal for more college financial aid. Uh, I also have a, uh, uh, a cancer joke book called Tumor Humor uh, that is based on jokes I wrote when I went through cancer treatment 19 years ago. So my focus is going to be a little bit more on uh, choosing a college and how to make the most out of college than it is about pure STEM research. But the, you'll see there are elements of research mixed into this. Uh, so let's talk about how to choose a college. Students should apply to a mix of colleges to ensure that they are likely to get into at least one. So the best ones are going to be what are called match colleges, where your test scores are within the middle 50th percentile of, uh, <clears throat> of the colleges based on their uh, the distribution of test scores uh, for their freshman class. A REACH college is one uh, where your, um, it looks like I uh, swapped around the percentiles, but 75% um, of the uh, students in that freshman class have better test scores than you do. And a safety school is where only 25% have a better test score than you do. This ensures that you have a mix of colleges and are more likely to get into one. Too often I see students who apply only to REACH schools and get into none of them, and then they have to scramble. Um, a safety school might include an in-state public college, which is also among the least expensive options, but because um, it's an in-state public college, they're, they're actually really, really good. Um, the, uh, the private colleges that you hear about in the school rankings in U.S. News and World Report and Kippinger aren't necessarily better 
than the uh, public colleges. You get just a good quality education at a quarter to a third the cost. Um, and in fact, if you look, go to payscale.com, they have some interesting data on the lifetime earnings based on the degree that you're in and the school you attended. And if you look at absolute dollar return on investment, the Ivy League colleges are at the top, but just a few dollars less are the public colleges for the same fields of study. And if you look at the percent return on investment, the um, what percentage you're getting uh, for every dollar you invest, uh, you end up um, with all the public colleges at the top because you're paying a lot less to get income that's only slightly less than the most selective of the colleges. Um, I also recommend applying that one of your safety schools should be a financial aid safety school where you could afford to attend even if you got no financial aid. And I recommend what I call the pick three approach. Based on uh, some research a survey of American freshmen, uh, the students were asked, are you at your first choice college, second choice, third choice, fifth, fourth choice, and, and so on. And 94% of them said that they were enrolled at one of their top three choices. So rather than having the child pick a single dream school, this college or nothing, in which case they might get disappointed because not everybody gets into their first choice college, when they do a pick three approach, they're probably going to get into one and they're probably going to be able to afford to enroll at that one as opposed to getting into a really costly college that they can't afford to attend. Um, I recommend comparing colleges based on the net price, not the sticker price. The net price is a concept that I invented uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, it's the difference between the cost of attendance and the gift aid, the grants and scholarships and other money that do not need to be repaid. Sounds kind of obvious, but back then, uh, colleges focus on a net cost figure, which subtract the entire financial aid package, uh, which or a ratio of grants to the total sticker price. I mean, this is actually a much better measure that reflects how much you're going to have to pay from your savings, from contributions from income, and from student loans to cover the college costs. And it's been encoded into law, I and mean, every college must now have a net price calculator on its website. Um, now, there are, it's not a perfect measure. There are uh, some problems with it. I mean, first of all, it's a one-year measure, uh, and about half of all colleges do what's called front-loading of grants, where you get a better mix of grants versus loans during your freshman year than in your sophomore, junior, and senior years. So your net price will actually go up in subsequent years, and that's about half of the colleges do that. Uh, so it's not necessarily pure, a, a good measure for reflecting your full college careers costs. And then there's something called scholarship displacement, where if you go out and win a private scholarship, the college wants you to tell them about it, and then they reduce your institutional grant, the money from the college itself, uh, by the amount of that private scholarship. So you have no net financial gain and no reduction in the net price. Uh, in five states now, uh, ban uh, scholarship displacement, and there are several others in the pipeline to do something similar. Your least expensive college is gonna be one of two types of colleges, either an in-state public college or a college with a no loans financial aid policy where they replace loans with grants in the financial aid package. There are only about six dozen of these no loans colleges and they tend to be the most uh, selective of the colleges. Now, to increase your eligibility for financial aid, first thing is you have to apply. You, you can't get money if you don't apply. Uh, and the free application for federal student aid, known as the FAFSA, becomes online, available starting October 1st. It's got a 21-month application season. Um, and it's based on two-year-old income inf information. It's called a base year or prior prior year. And you want to minimize income during that base year and each subsequent year to maximize eligibility for need-based financial aid because the FAFSA measures your ability to pay based on your discretionary income and your assets. And so there are some things that you should be aware of during the prior prior year, uh, minimize capital gains or offset them with capital losses. Uh, you can actually have uh, negative, up to negative $3,000 of capital losses greater than the capital gains, which uh, reduces your 
adjusted gross income, improving your aid eligibility. Try to defer an unusual income like bonuses and stock and exercising stock options until it no longer matters. Retirement plans, if you take a distribution from a retirement plan, it counts as income. And that includes even a tax-free return of contributions from a Roth IRA. And the FAFSA bases aid eligibility on just one parent when the parents are divorced or separated. And to some extent, the family can choose which parent is the one who's going to be able, who's going to file the financial aid forms. And obviously, you'd want the parent with a lower income and the lower assets to file the form. However, if that parent is remarried, the step-parent's income and assets must be reported, even if there's a prenuptial agreement. You should also spend down assets, like use it to pay off debt. That improves your financial aid picture while not changing your net worth in any way. Student assets are assessed at a heavier rate than parent assets. So you should spend the student assets on their college education before touching parent assets. Uh, there's the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which is based on $4,000 of tuition and textbook expenses. Uh, and you should use that before relying on college savings plans or uh, other resources in order to maximize that grant. Now, one thing that families need to do that they don't always do, in fact, it's relatively rare, is to appeal for more financial aid. Uh, the basics are if you have special circumstances, which is a difference, a change in your income from that two-year-old income information to the present, like uh, job loss or pay cuts, or anything that distinguishes you from the typical family, like high unreimbursed medical or dental expenses, high dependent care costs, uh, the parents are enrolled in college, that's an appealable item. And uh, the colleges can take that into account and they can do one of two things with those special circumstances. They can change the uh, data elements on the FAFSA. So if you, you have lower income now, they can choose to substitute a lower income value. You can't do it, but they can. Uh, or the cost of attendance can be adjusted. Like if you're disabled and you have special needs expenses, they can add that to the cost of attendance. And since financial aid is based on financial need, which is the difference between that cost of attendance and the EFC, your expected family contribution, a measure of your family's ability to pay. If you increase the cost of attendance, you're increasing financial need. If you decrease the expected family contribution, you're increasing financial need. So a middle income student attending a higher cost college may still qualify for financial aid, even though their income is and their EFC is higher because the cost is higher. This entire process is driven by documentation like the one a copy of your layoff notice or recent receipt of unemployment benefits. And you can appeal at any time. It's best to do this when you get the financial aid award letter or even when you're applying for financial aid. But if you lose your job in the middle of the year, you can appeal for more aid in the middle of the year. Colleges maintain contingency funds to cover that. And if it's a discretionary choice, some colleges will be resistant to making an adjustment Whereas if it's beyond the family's control, then uh, they're more likely to make an adjustment. But job loss and pay cuts are the number one reasons why colleges make an adjustment. We talked about need-based aid. Now let's talk about merit-based aid, like scholarships. Generally, grants are need-based and scholarships are merit-based based on academic, artistic, or athletic talent, or weird skills like making a prom costume out of duct tape which is a real scholarship. I'll show you a picture in a bit. And the, the gist is you need to start searching immediately because there are deadlines throughout the year and even in younger grades. Use a free scholarship matching website like fastweb.com or the College Board's Big Future to search for scholarships. They'll match your background against a large database of scholarships. And then it's up to you to go to those uh, scholarship providers' websites to apply. These search tools have optional questions and required questions. If you answer the optional questions, on average, you're going to get twice as many matches. Uh, also, don't just think everything's online. There are still offline uh, sources of information, like scholarship listing books in your library or local bookstore. You should check the copyright date. If it's more than a year or two old, it's too old to be useful. Uh, there's also bulletin boards outside the school counselor's office or the financial aid office that may have information about small local awards that don't want to be listed. 
as well as military student aid like ROTC scholarships. And even after you're already enrolled in college, you want to continue searching for scholarships because there are only, some scholarships are only available to students who are currently enrolled in college. And obviously, ask your employers because many employers provide employer educational assistance. Now, finding scholarships is only half the problem. I mean, it takes only half an hour to search any of these databases. You actually have to apply for them, which is more work. But after you've done your first half dozen or so scholarships, uh, you find yourself being able to reuse your essays with slight tweaks, uh, which makes it much easier to apply to lots and lots of scholarships. And the students who win a gazillion dollars in scholarships like me, uh, they apply to many, many scholarships, hundreds of scholarships. I mean, your odds of winning any one scholarship are small, but the it's kind of a numbers game. The more you apply, the more likely you are to win. Uh, and you should apply to everyone for which you're eligible, and not just the less competitive ones, like small awards, you're more likely to win them, but you want to apply to everything for which you're eligible. Uh, I suggest creating an accomplishments resume that lists your uh, activities, hobbies, honors, and awards, not just to help you search for scholarships, but also to give to people who are writing letters of recommendation, lets them pretend to know you better than they actually do. Uh, follow the directions carefully. If they say 300 word essay and you're at 301, they won't read your essay. They, they, these are in part designed to test whether you're able to follow directions. Because they're looking at your written words mostly in these applications, if you've got spelling and grammatical errors, typos throughout it, it gives a bad impression. So proofread before you submit. Uh, and don't miss the deadline. If you're a day after the deadline, you don't get considered no matter how good you are. And uh, keep a copy of the application for your records so that if it is lost in the mail, you'll be able to send it uh, again or a copy of the file. I find that students have trouble writing essays and there's a trick that works for many people and not just students, and that's to answer the question out loud while recording yourself and then transcribe that recording. It's going to be stream of consciousness, a little bit free flowing. So you'll need to do some editing, like maybe create an outline from your thoughts afterwards. But you'll find that most people speak at about 200 words a minute. Uh, so it takes just a few minutes of speaking to get enough words for a 300 or 1000 word essay. Uh, and it'll be more passionate and more personal, which yields a better essay. Uh, and the same thing can work for proofreading. Take your final essay, print it out so it looks different than on the screen, and read it out loud. Anytime you stumble, put an X there and then continue. Those disfluencies are signs of some kind of a problem, maybe a spelling error, maybe a grammatical error, maybe it's not flowing right, uh, maybe there's a logical error. Then you fix those problems and you repeat, and that yields a much better essay. And uh, also, I recommend that you Google yourself uh, and look at your Facebook account or other social media accounts for negative information. About a quarter of scholarship providers are going to search for you. Uh, and if they see a red flag, they're not going to consider you. So if you've got a bad attitude or I mean, uh, photos showing illegal drug use or uh, alcohol use or whatever, they're going to they're going to think that you're not going to reflect well on their organization and they won't give you the award. Now, I told you about the duct tape scholarship. This are, shows pictures from the last few years of some of the winning costumes. I mean, there is now a dress and tux categories, each of which wins $10,000 prize. And the school also receives some money when the student wins. And you can tell these are amazingly intricate creations. And part of the, what makes them work is that duct tape comes in colors other than gray. I, I believe the, the school, the secondary school, gets $5,000. Um, and you no longer have to wear it to the prom because of COVID-19. Now, oftentimes people encounter scholarship scams. And these are organizations that say, pay us some money and you won a scholarship. And the reality is they pocket the money, you never get the scholarship. And it may seem innocuous, like the taxes or an application fee, and it might be a nominal amount, like two or $3. They, 
they get in 100,000 applications, that's $300,000. So the number one rule is if you have to pay money to get money, it's probably a scam. Uh, and a scholarship is uh, it's about giving away money, not getting money. And the, the other tips here are in variations or other details about it. And, uh, and one that I'm emphasizing these days is what's called an advance fee loan scam. With the loan forgiveness that President Biden has announced, there are a lot of organizations that are calling up I mean, robocalls. I've gotten a few saying to the students, oh, pay us money and we'll make sure you get your forgiveness because nobody's received forgiveness yet. And uh, and th these are outright scams. You can't ask for a fee upfront uh, to do what's called credit repair. And uh, and so applying for forgiveness is credit repair. And so that's fraudulent on both the federal and state level. The Federal Trade Commission state attorney generals had uh, still have an operation game of loans to crack down on these scams. Uh, a few tips on how to cut college costs. Um, attend a cheaper college. You get just as good quality of education at much lower cost. Uh, try to graduate in three years instead of four or more realistically in four years instead of five. Um, if you take just 12 credits a term, you're considered to be enrolled full-time, but in order to graduate in four years, you actually have to take 15 credits a semester. And you could also do an accelerated degree program taking classes in the summer or do what I did, which is get two majors for the price of one. And uh, so there are a lot of ways that you could make the expense more efficient. Textbooks are a big part of the college costs, especially at lower cost colleges. So you can save about half of the cost by buying used textbooks or selling your textbooks back to the bookstore at the end of the semester. You could live at home or get a roommate and live off campus to cut your housing costs, but you're less likely to graduate if you, if you do that. Um, so it, it does come with a cost. Now, student loans are, very prominent. It's in, if you apply for financial aid, you're probably going to ha have to borrow about three quarters of undergraduate students graduate with student loan debt. If you apply for financial aid, the percentage uh, increases to seven eighths. The only way is to go to a less expensive college or to pick uh, wealthy parents. So there are a couple tips here about how to reduce your borrowing costs. I mean, obviously focus on free money first. Uh, tuition installment plans spread out your payments over the course of a year. Don't charge interest, though they may charge an upfront fee. And there are reasonable alternative to long-term student loan debt, which does charge interest, so it's cheaper. One of my favorite tips is to live like a student while you're at school, so you don't have to live like a student after you graduate. If you don't like your meal plan, and so you're buying a $10 pizza every week, by the time you graduate, that $10 pizza will have cost you about $2,000, if you use borrowed money to pay for it, every dollar you borrow costs about $2 by the time you repay the debt. Uh, so that works out to be about $4,000. That's an awful lot of pizza. And that's a, buying beverages from vending machines or specialty drinks or coffees, and they can all add up. Federal student loans are cheaper, more available, and better repayment terms than private student loans. They offer loan forgiveness options and not just the recent... Uh, offer from uh, President Biden. They also have public service loan forgiveness, teacher loan forgiveness. Uh, you can get up to $17,500 of uh, a teacher uh, of federal student loans uh, and federal Stafford loans that you borrowed uh, it forgiven uh, over a five-year period if you're a teacher. You should ask your uh, school district about that. Um, and if you're applying for a private loan, apply with a credit-worthy co-signer because they base the eligibility and the interest rate you pay on the higher of the two credit scores. I mentioned that one of my my most recent book is how to graduate, who graduates from college, who doesn't, and so it involves over 700 tables and charts based on analysis of data uh, from a variety of data sets that let me identify uh, trends in college graduation. And here, here are some of the the key things. The better your high school GPA, the more likely you are to graduate with a bachelor's degree and also with less debt. Math matters a lot. The more math you take, the more likely you are to graduate. In fact, if you take calculus in high school, you're twice as likely to graduate with a bachelor's degree as compared with someone whose top math class was Algebra 1. And it's a continuum. Each additional math class, more advanced math class, increases your likelihood of graduating from college with a bachelor's degree. 
And it doesn't matter if it's four years or six years, it's proportional. Majoring in STEM increases your likelihood of graduating from college and also reduces your likelihood of borrowing to pay for college. If you work a full-time job, you're half as likely to graduate with a bachelor's degree as compared to someone who works 12 hours or less a week. If you work up to 12 hours, you are more likely to graduate than someone who doesn't work at all. Not clear why, maybe it's because it forces you to learn time management skills. Enrollment status, if you enroll half-time, you're half as likely to graduate. And it's not just because you're stretching out longer, the lack of the intensity of the program uh, reduces your likelihood of obtaining that degree. And I am extremely negative on gap years because my research has shown that 10% of the students don't ever return from a gap year. And of those who do return from a gap year, only half end up graduating with bachelor's degree within six years. Slightly better if it's a structured gap year, but it's still a very dismal college graduation rate. So that's uh, it for my part of the presentation. Awesome. Thank you. There's this information if you want to get in touch with them. And next we'll have Rob and Stephen. Unfortunately, Mark, I think it's Steve and I are the high performers on your last couple of slides. So we're going to tell a story that's a little bit different than going straight to university, but it's more about engineering disciplines within industry. So Steve, are you ready? Yeah, absolutely. Hi guys. Um, yeah, like Mark says, right? Uh, sorry, as Rob says, we both have, I guess the, the one big difference is that we're, both Rob and I both work, we work at Illumina. So we're in, um, we're in the commercial sector of STEM and work for, Illumina is, a, is the world leader in uh, genomic sciences and we develop instruments and, and the science around genomic sequencing. And so ours is a very kind of cutting edge, um, kind of leading edge of, um, in the commercial space right now. So, uh, and Rob and I both work on the, on the physical instruments and supporting customers, you know, at, in universities and hospitals around the world. And so we just, you know, yeah, we've given our uh, quick little, uh, you know, five, 10 minutes about this now. So as you can tell, I'm not from, you know, this part, these shores. I was born and raised in East London and uh, joined the Royal Navy after high school to do my uh, training and, and degree program. Effectively joined as a, as a weapon engineer, uh, working on radio and electronic systems. So that after, you know, some time uh, in, in training that kind of was the equivalent of a, of a U.S. associate's degree in engineering. And then you get, you go to see actually work on some of those instruments They go back in and uh, get promoted up and do more college classes, learn more systems, whether they be radar, communication, sonar, you know, electronic warfare, that kind of stuff. And they will start adding into your, um, they will start adding into your systems and that will, that will actually kind of, uh, you know, gauges how you go in, in your career. Um, I was in the Royal Navy for 11 years, and then after that left and joined a, a company uh, here in the U.S., American Science and Engineering. They make um, cross-border x-ray systems uh, and airport x-ray systems, actually. So, I mean, pretty much everyone who calls into this call would have gone through an airport at some point, whether it be a baggage scanner, an x-ray, a body scanner, um, or, you know, a big cross-border x-ray system. I, I was there for 11 years as well. So, um, jump on to the next slide, Rob. Um, and then right now, I, I, since I've been at Illumina here, um, I joined, Rob and I used to work together as senior FSEs uh, in Texas. Um, I live just north of San Antonio. Um, I'm now an associate director of field service, um, leading the team of, it's a, it's a bit of a thumb wheel right now, nine to 15 different FSEs across the Southeast or great, greater Mid-South districts. Um, totally responsible for delivering on the company's uh, key performance indicators, right? Making sure that the customers and universities, the teaching hospitals, uh, the for-profit consumers, you know, accounts like um, people that know about 23andMe or Ancestry DNA, all utilize our systems to, to generate their data, to make sure that the, the customers are satisfied that they can actually use the systems and, and they're enabled to, to truly understand the science as well. Huge part of my job is employee development. We get a lot of young graduates from school that have spent an awful lot of time and money getting through and get in their um, degrees. And then they come into the commercial workplace and then not really understand what it is to have to work in a commercial environment. It's entirely very, very different than academia. Well, and, and the two things are, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a whole host of differences. So a, a lot of my job is the employee development of, of getting people from with the, the smarts and the understands who can actually do the job to physically being able to do it in the field and working in a different kind of corporate structure. So very important to be completely open and honest. Um, be able to make hard decisions is, is one of the kind of key differentiators in, in, in my role and then stand by them. 
and and also know that that you know I don't pretend to be the smartest person in the room, and certainly in my team, uh, I really want to and and get great desire in hiring people who are more qualified and better at their job than I ever could have been. Um, I think uh, I take a great pride in that, and that it's uh, it's a really important thing for us to do in in the corporate side as well. So, yeah, um, I've been here for twelve years. That one of the things I would definitely uh, recommend to any students is is just that kind of really having that determination and sticking with things. I think one of the red flags that we see is people that jump routinely and often every couple of years is is just not a great selling point in the corporate world. Being able to stick at something for a longer period is a much stronger selling opportunity for us. Thanks, Steve. So my name is Rob Beach. I grew up an army brat, so I grew up across Europe. Um, I moved around enough that I went to three different high schools in three different states. So I think I think to Mark's point, I did a lot of math in high school. When you see what I did in the army, we did a lot of math there, which which helped me, I think, go back to college and actually go ahead and get my AS and, and my BS later. Um, because it was always at night school or weekends, I couldn't go the traditional route to go back to university. And in a lot of the previous conversation when they were talking about, you know, Mark was telling you how to get into college and how to go ahead and make it cheaper and easier for you. Because we, Steve and I, neither of us went the traditional route. It took longer to get there. So to, to the points earlier, it took me probably 10 years after I got out of the army before I actually got my associate's degree because I was working in industry the entire time. So that's a little bit about my background. It, it could have been someone in maintenance who's seen it, someone in the engineering team, someone in the quality assurance team. It could have been anybody who happened to see that, but nobody's seen it and called it out and it caused that tragedy. You've got to feel empowered to speak up and you need to pay attention to what's going on around you. The second picture is a bridge. We see We see pictures all the time of bridges that fail, whether it's because the design engineer didn't you know, they, they just didn't know about the environmental factors that are there, or you hear stories, it's been a while that somebody designed something using standard um, screws and standard uh, measurements, and then it turns out that the person who put it together, put it together in metric, All right? So Steve being from, from the UK, he and I might not put things together in the same manner if it's not documented properly. This is my timeline um, for my career progression. So in 1989, when I graduated high school, I went straight in the army. but Everyone who says that they went into the military, everyone seems to think that there's one career path in the military. When I went in, I went in to work on military intelligence electronics equipment. I had 12 solid months of nothing but electrical theory and systems. Within that, that six years I was in the military, I reclassed and I started working on military intelligence equipment that were, were uh, aircraft. So it was another six months of nothing but electronics. So I didn't, didn't study the Englishes, I didn't study all the other things to make me a more well-rounded person, but lots of math. There was lots and lots of math involved and lots of electronics. When I got out of the army, I went and some people who, who have been around or my age or older, they're gonna remember the older nuclear missile systems, the Minuteman. The Minuteman was upgraded to the REACT nuclear missile system. So I was part of the deployment team for that. When that contract was coming to an end, I went into semiconductor and I've worked in semiconductor as a field service engineer, as an on-site technician, I've helped process engineers and, and some of the design engineers for all kinds of different instrumentation. We've worked on robotics, work on automation. But around 2011, one of my daughters asked me, what was I doing to help society? I did nuclear missiles, I was in the military, I'm in semiconductor. So I started researching different companies that were doing things to help the greater good. And Illumina, as we go through these slides, you're going to see some of the stuff that the technology is used for. And that's really important, in my opinion, for where we're going in life. And it, it's not just for the 23andMe's. You see it on forensic shows. You see it in pharmaceutical companies. And you see it in all these major hospitals, whether they're cancer centers, whether they're other research hospitals. They're all over the place. So it, it's really important to understand the different things that are there in industry. So... Here's the, the marketing slide, the history of Illumina. We're about 24 years old, got about 9,100 employees worldwide, and we service over 140 countries. 2021, $4.5 billion in revenue. All of that's great, but I'm not really on the business side. I'm much more on the, the hardware, the engineering, and what we're doing at the end. So the portion of this slide that stands out to me is that bottom left area. In 2001, it cost $100 million to sequence a whole human genome. Last year, it was less than $600. Steve will talk to, to the next slide, and he's going to talk about 
a new instrument that was just announced that even drives it below $600. And as we get going, there's going to be one slide that's a case study of somebody who sequencing really helped them in their life. The cheaper we can get the sequencing down to, it's going to be more readily available for everybody in the world. So, Steve? Yeah, I think this is my last slide. So, uh, yeah, as Rob said, um, Illumina's just uh, developed this NovaSeq X, which is our next um, uh, sequencing instrument that's, that's actually going to, that was launched uh, just a couple of weeks ago and is actually available to be shipping out um, early part of next year. But this will really, the, the goal with, with genomics um, is really to democratize the, the entire science and make it affordable for everyone. Nobody can spend $100 million to sequence their genome to find out what's wrong, but everybody can get to a couple of hundred dollars. Um, and that's when insurance agencies, um, you know, even national health services like across Europe, socialized healthcare, um, have the, the funds that this starts to become very, very important for us. Um, the Novacic X expands upon our existing technologies. We've made able to add a whole host of different um, technologies into this instrument to, to get the cost down to around 200, uh, uh, cost $200, sorry, um, per human genome. Um, and they're really, it's basically faster, cheaper, and cleaner. We have a, you know, the engineering motto is fast, cheap, clean, pick any two. It's really one of the things that that we have made it better and cheaper, and and it costs less than uh, than the previous one did. It's it's incredibly good on that. It's a huge development in in science to make this happen. Um, there's a there's another part of our obviously the of the industry and, and the world that we live in making things more sustainable we have less 90 percent less packaging we no longer have to ship uh, reagents on dry ice which is not a big deal in the us right we have dry ice it's very available you all know from the covid vaccines um you know shipping vaccines and everything on dry ice is is not an issue in in the us it becomes a very big issue when you start to go into remote parts of central america or or into central africa now all of a sudden you really can't get to those areas um just with the logistical challenges that you have we've been able to engineer out these those solutions and, and a lot of these things are comes kind of comes back to what rob was saying about with engineering it's the details that matter it's it really is about looking at something and then trying to and trying to engineer a solution to what that that problem can be and just looking at the details and really identifying what the solution can be so yeah that's that's really where we're at here so honestly me when i graduated high school in 1989 till today i think that i've gotten uh, more immature every year so when i was reading this slide deck earlier that steve and i were looking at when i got to this point i was like so what all right, so we showed a bunch of marketing slides. We talked about, you know, all this nice stuff. But what, is, what does this technology really do? So this is an old case study from the New York Times in June of 2014. At the time, Joshua was 14 years old, and him and his family, went, they went to Puerto Rico. He ended up developing a meningitis-like symptoms, right? And he came back, and he did a battery of tests. All those tests ended up being negative. They couldn't figure out what was going on with Joshua. It was so bad, they put him in a medically induced coma. So being a parent, I can't imagine what those parents were going through at this point in time, or whoever the adults were taking care of him. It, it would drive me sick just thinking about it. They did a brain biopsy. 48 hours later, they had sequenced the samples. They got the results back. Penicillin treated his illness. So this young person had to be stuck in a medically induced coma because the old traditional routes of testing him showed nothing and they didn't know what was causing his issues. He had swelling on the brain. Now we're faster and we're cheaper and we can sequence more today in 48 hours than we even thought possible a couple of years ago. So it's a powerful tool and the engineers you're training today in school and that are gonna to go to universities, they're gonna help push this to the next level. So it's really important that they understand just how important that work is. So the next question I'd be asking if I was an educator is, does Illumina have resources that can help educators? The answer is yes. So there's a link right there on the website. If you go to Illumina.com, you go to our company about us, there's a corporate social responsibility and power communities, and then there's the STEM education. It brings you to this page right here. So what type of stuff is on here? Because it says it's exploring genomics for every age. So what I don't have here is when you first go onto that site, there are coloring books. So you can download coloring books from someone in preschool and kindergarten to get them started. And then it goes all the way up to virtual labs and virtual field trips with Illumina, adventures in genomics, the DNA decode in the bottom left, that's another partner site 
that does a lot of work. And I've, I've gone to a couple of different high schools and talked to a couple of different science, forensics, and engineering courses or classes. And that tends to be one of the websites that, that the students really enjoy. So if I were you, I would take the time to go ahead and look at that website. And I'm gonna go back one slide. So that URL is sitting there again. I would take the time to look at it because it doesn't just show Illumina's resources, it links out to partners. And that's all we got. Awesome. Thank you so much um, again for everyone for sharing. We do have a couple of questions that uh, we wanna hear back from pretty much each uh, presenter. Um, so, Dr. Um, Georgia, so what was what was or has been the high um, the highlight of um, that particular research, or what what was it, um, was there anything that was unexpected that you came across that you weren't expecting to to kind of come across in that research with the turtles? Well, both projects. In the first one, talking about the railroad tracks, uh, there was no published information on really on turtles on railroad tracks yet they're the second bit largest besides highways and roads, sort of infrastructure for transportation in the world and in the United States. And again, you're dealing with a situation where in the next you know, century here, perhaps half of the species will become extinct. So it was um, it's depressing on a level of knowing that um, uh, the tracks have such a significant impact also on some of those turtles, uh, snapping turtles are a very large turtle. And yet I think the design of a track, which is like a T in shape, confuses turtles. So they first they start getting channeled to walk along it rather than crawling over it once they get on the tracks. And then they often bump their head, I believe, on the top of the T of the track. And uh, so they then overheat. Uh, the good news is with this sort of research, especially for endangered species, and I didn't have time to tell you about it, but the females, the reason we're finding more females is that they leave different bodies of water and they move inland to lay their eggs. And so for threatened species of turtles, using things like perhaps tunnels, and in Massachusetts, they've started uh, using basically concrete to lift up tracks and support them, but to provide tunnels for endangered species of turtles to go underneath. So I think that that was really great. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Next, um, Mark. So one, you had a, a ton of helpful information for our teachers in, in terms of navigating the, the college or helping students navigate that. Can you share um, just a little bit more? Um, you mentioned um, front loading and scholarship displacement. Um, I'll, I'll, I've, I've heard of front loading before, but I believe this is my first time hearing of displacement myself. So if you could, if you have anything else that you can kind of just elaborate on with, with front loading and scholarship displacement. Okay. Well, front loading is when you don't get as good a mix of grants versus loans after the first year. Uh, and some colleges, they'll give you the same loan, the same grants each year but the costs go up each year and so you're getting more loans in subsequent years but in in some colleges they even reduce the grants after the first year because way they you're already committed to that college you're less likely to transfer to another college uh there's a simple way to tell if a college practices front loading of grants uh, and that's to use a tool called college navigator which is available on the u.s department of education's website it has for each college the uh, average grants and the percentage of receiving grants for first year students versus all undergraduate students. So you look at those average figures. If the average grant is lower in subsequent years, now this is a one year snapshot, and it's a sign that the college does front loading grants, or if the percentage receiving grants has decreased significantly, it's a sign that the college practices front loading of grants. With regard to scholarship displacement, the colleges say that they can't, the students can't be overawarded. In other words, you can't receive more need-based financial aid than you have demonstrated financial need. And so they say when you're overawarded because you won that private scholarship, they have to reduce your financial aid package and they reduce their grants because that's money that they're spending and that eliminates the overward. The problem with this is it's not actually true. I mean, first of all, federal law only requires uh, total uh, financial aid to not exceed the cost of attendance. 
and only a certain type of financial aid called campus-based aid can't be over-awarded. Uh, other than that, I, it's entirely the college's own policies. Um, and the average unmet need, the gap between financial aid and financial need is over $10,000 these days. So there is plenty of room for them to have that private scholarship fill unmet need uh, and not result in an overward. But the colleges, for their own policies there, when you receive a private scholarship, they want to take it for granted and use it to reduce their financial commitment to the specific student and instead use that, free up that budget money for other students. And so you, you end up with uh, an impact on the net price of zero. Uh, and so despite all the hard work that student had, there's no net improvement in outcomes. And scholarship providers are trying to reduce the debt and work burden of their scholars. And when the scholarship is fully displaced, there's no net improvement and so net, no net improvement in graduation rates. Uh, and so the, the, the scholarship providers get pretty upset about this. Uh, and they want the, the colleges to uh, be more accommodating. And maybe if they, they're going to displace, maybe reduce loans before you reduce grants, uh, or and maybe do a 50-50 so that there's at least some financial benefit to the student. Now, to tell if a college practices front-loading uh, um, scholarship displacement, you could look on their website to see uh, if there's an outside scholarship policy, which is what they call it, um, the problem with that is not every college does that. And if they do it, I mean, half of them are as clear as mud. Um, but uh, the scholarship provider might be able to tell you historically if they found that the students, uh, their scholars have been displaced at those colleges. And there are some colleges that have historically had very high scholarship displacement rates. Um, and it's a prevalent practice. Uh, I did a survey with an organization called Student Beans, uh, which is a, um, a discount website for college students. And they, uh, they surveyed their students, over a million students, and found that 50% of those who had received a scholarship had experienced scholarship displacement. So it's a pretty common problem. And it's something to be aware of, especially if you're bringing in a lot of scholarship money uh, to maybe try negotiating with the college that they don't displace your scholarship. Or if they do, I mean, consider that when you're looking at the financial fit of one college versus another, not just the academic fit and social fit and environmental fit, because it does affect how much you're going to have to pay for that college. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Rob and Steven. Do I have Rob and or Steven? Yeah, we're both here. Rob's okay. on the line. He's good at answering questions. <laughs> <Okay>. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to kind of ask a little bit more. I remember when um, sequencing was, was relatively new and cost, again, $100 million. Um, with the cost being reduced and kind of consistently being reduced or, you know, with, with effort. What do you see the benefits or how do you, what do you see the, the greatest benefits to, um, to society, I guess, with, with lowering the cost for the gene, um, genome sequencing and some of your concerns, I guess, where the technology can go with that being so cheap. Steve, I'll let you go first. I'm generous today. Okay. Hi. Right. Yeah. So obviously, <laughs> The, the, the biggest challenge as we continue to reduce the cost of the sequencing, you open up the market. So from a, from a commercial activity perspective, it's the, the cheaper you make something, the more adoption you get of it, the greater the, uh, the greater that market becomes. So it's, it's incredibly valuable for us from a commercial entity, but ultimately the, you know, the, 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 um, what's the, the corporate message for Illumina is, you know, improving human health by understanding the, the, power of the genome. The, the more that we understand what's going on inside of our genome, the better we can make advances in, in, in pharmacology, in, uh, in, just, in just in medical science and the development of medicines. There's all kinds of different research that happens both across, and it's not just humans, and it's not just, you know, 
own human genome sequencing, sequencing across crosses all kinds of all barriers from agricultural uh, through, as I said, through pharmacology, through human genetics and, and everywhere in between. And so as we start to, as that becomes a lot cheaper, the, the market becomes so much bigger, then there is some very real issues and very real concerns about what happens with that data, right? And as insurance companies start to, you know, okay, this makes much more sense for us to identify a cancer much earlier in life and we can, and we can grab that. What happens to, what happens to that individual that has a, that has, you know, a, a certain gene variant that, that maybe will, you know, um, have the ability to, to develop something later in life. And what do we do? What happens with that data? What happens to that person? So these, it's definitely one of the concerns. Uh, the more knowledge that we all have, the, the better we are, right? That's why we, that's why you go to a doctor's for an annual test. That's why you have your lipids and your normal blood works done all of the time every year now. So because the, uh, as we know, the more data you have, the, the better you, you are at, at addressing it and controlling it and, and, and acting upon that. So yeah, that's, it, it is a concern, but it's, it's, it's the right move forward as we continue to make, you know, science improve the, the human life. And that's really what we're looking at, aiming to do here. Yeah. So, anything to add, Rob? No, I, I know it's a, it's a really hot topic about ethics and what you're going to do with, with the genome. Um, not too long ago, we presented at a, at a high school and we presented at a forensics class. So we're talking about how all these people had been found innocent through the innocence programs using DNA sequencing. Right, so people who had been behind bars for decades are now getting released, and and that's a great thing. One of the students brought up a couple of different programs where they're doing more type of engineering instead of just sequencing for for what most people would consider normal ethical reasons. Like like Steve said, the greater good is what we're working for, and the ethics problems and questions. There are there are ethics experts who've got to work on that, not the engineers. All right. So again, I would love to thank you for joining us to our panelists. Thank you again for sharing with us, with your with our teachers, um, kind of your insights and your knowledge on STEM. Mm -hmm.